So NATO is now contemplating anything from public health infrastructures, digital networks, climate change to tackling disinformation as part of its modern playbook. Now, having reinvented itself as a liberal security community committed to conjoining democracies in a cooperative security framework after the collapse of the Soviet Union, NATO has indeed demonstrated an institutional adaptability, which is quite reminiscent of those of you who might remember Woody Allen's earlier, better movies, uh, the one from 1983 called Celik, uh, who was a chameleon-like character whose fortunes depend on an ability to mimic the features of his social milieu. So I think NATO very much figures as one these days also. In the pandemic times of the early 2020s, NATO is riding parallel tracks. So there is this traditional military security gear, deterrence and defense mission, inter alia on its eastern flank. And there is a comprehensive approach to security and crisis management that has recently also included a COVID-19 task force to coordinate the delivery of medical aid across and beyond the territory of the Alliance. So in many ways, NATO appears to be the epitome of resilience in the face of the many fluctuations of contemporary international politics and, and changing notions of security. And yet this balancing act also raises questions about the compatibility between the logics of security and, and resilience. Academic literature draws a distinction between threats and risks, but NATO speak and popular use, of course, tend to conflate the two. Protecting against Avoiding or deterring threats is at the heart of the logic of security. Being prepared for various risks, able to mitigate damage and carry on even in case of a security breach stands at the core of resilience. So threats are to be eliminated, but risks are to be managed. And first of all, they need to be possible to be identified. Threat-based security, as uh, Olaf Corey puts it, handles direct causes of harm whereas risk security is targeted towards the constitutive causes of harm or the conditions of possibility. Accordingly, resilience is a thinking and acting frame for the world of continuous risk management, sharing and promoting a vision of long-term precautionary government. So resilience can theoretically serve as a precursor to security, but it is not its direct equivalent. While both security and resilience logics share an inclination for prediction and prevention, the political stakes of resilience as a risk governance template for NATO self-projection in the world still invite further reflection. So the question is really, what does NATO do when it uh, keeps evoking re resilience and when it does resilience? <clears throat> now to start, Resilience uh, from uh, the Latin word resilio, or to jump back, uh, remains, surprise, an essentially contested concept, regardless of its status as an organizing principle of contemporary political life. Resilience is awkwardly, uh, if politically conveniently, situated in time. It is both backwards oriented, prompting actors to learn from past disruptions and disasters, and hence it's all about coping, adaptation, recovery, bouncing back, overcoming, you name it. But it's also future directed. It invites societies to become more responsive, proactively prepared for an era of potential interferences in space. Now reflecting this fluid definition, scholarly opinion remains very much divided about whether or not resilience is actually a good thing. Is it a positive manifestation of adaptation to adversity, or is it rather really you know, a negative symptom of neoliberalism, where the agency of political actors is very much deemed dependent on their self-reliance and ability to acquiesce to the status quo, rather than uh, to resist or, or to rebel? So this logic of resilience is consequently also tied to the controllability and manageability of risks. Now, Compared to security, resilience is a more modest concept. It is less ambitious, it is less absolutist in its attempt to control the future, as well as it is more pragmatic and it is more accommodating in the face of the inevitable presence of various complex insecurities. Since the safe harbor does not exist in risk society, to borrow the famous concepts by the German sociologist Ulrich Beck, resilience approach probes ways of coping with irresolute and indeed oftentimes wicked problems. 
So resilience is something that incorporates contingency, but it seeks to live with it rather than tame it, quite to the contrary of the gist and endeavor of security. Consequently, resilience as a governance approach also normalizes crisis and conflicts. Compared to the logic of security, we could say that resilience delivers a non-promise of sorts. It enables the actor calling for and thereby seeking to enact resilience to also remain relatively non-committal vis-a-vis distinct political options for how do we get there. And hence, you can see why this is also very much politically attractive a notion. And of course, the political attractiveness of resilience also relies in its convenient movement between the past and the future. Since resilience is about bouncing back as well as bouncing forward, it enables navigation between accommodation and the opportunity to reorganize. So there is, some would argue, still also some transformational potential to resilience. But I would suggest that resilience thinking fundamentally reflects agents, including NATO's desire for ontological security, the security of the self. It provides this modest, pragmatic, non-committal policy response to this need at the same time. And since resilience is a process rather than implying some final outcome, it is politically indeed a very useful uh, strategy because who wouldn't want to cope with change and spring back from distress, from manifold crises and challenges? Who would actually resist the importance of being better prepared for crisis? But also how convenient it is to concurrently acknowledge one's vulnerability and hence ultimate inability to be held fully accountable for whatever happens. And of course, international policy actors and NATO is not alone, uh, obviously, are very much also lured by the concept of resilience because it uh, enables uh, to emphasize uh, and you know, bring on board collaboration across different institutional and, and policy silos. But to move to the empirical uh, sort of uh, mapping of what the NATO actually does when it does resilience, if, as I suggested, resilience is effectively about keeping NATO's ship afloat, then what are its dimensions and meanings? What is to be made resilient for NATO to be resilient? And why is resilience sought in the first place? And where can NATO's repertoires of resilience be found? How does the Alliance's orientation towards risk management and resilience planning measure up to its more traditional emphasis on honing concrete threat-based responses? In sum, what, why, where, and how is NATO resilience? Now, NATO's take on resilience is, uh, I would suggest, fourfold. It pertains to the alliance's political unity, democratic essence, thirdly, to its reputation uh, or credibility, and last not least, to the institutional endurance of NATO. Now, uh, if I go to the what question first, in official NATO speak, resilience is very much framed as a whole of government approach. So it's part of this alliance's comprehensive 360 degree approach to security. As NATO's erstwhile Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges, Jamie Shi has put it, resilience is, and I quote him, the corollary of deterrence and reassurance measures in the classical military sphere. And there are seven baseline requirements ranging from the assured continuity of critical government services, energy supplies, ability to deal effectively with migration flows, mass casualties, sustainable food and water resources, to communications and transportation systems. So we can see how NATO seeks resilience in pretty different fields, actually. There are these critical infrastructures, including civilian infrastructure, you know, anything from transport airfields, uh, harbor supply chains telecommunications, including 5G, undersea cables, the internet, cyber and hybrid threats, disinformation, terrorism, public health. If you think of the NATO's pandemic response fund, for instance, during, the, during this pandemic. Now, the big issues in NATO's resilience agenda include climate change. Uh, and perhaps we can you know, speak more about that in the Q&A. Uh, also global and regional security architectures, but last not least, also strong societies, without which arguably strong defense cannot be had. So when NATO speaks about societal resilience, it speaks also about data protection, managing the impact of NATO, uh, new, new technologies and labor markets, and protection from nefarious foreign investments and intellectual property theft. 
but vitally also such important and big topics as robust citizenry and freedom, democracy and the rule of law, which are arguably the values that provide the glue for the political West. So it's very much also about resilient society as the first line of defense, which is why it's, it's suggested by the NATO spokespeople that resilience must be at the very core of our societies and of our security. Now, if I go to the why question, then the robust resilience of NATO's individual subparts, that is the allied nations, indeed emerges as an important prerequisite in NATO's discourse to fulfill its main mission, its collective security and defense mission. Resilience also pertains to NATO's stability and reconstruction efforts in various conflicts and post-conflict environments. And of course, it's referred to in the context of particular technological solutions, such as the CRAM capabilities initiative. But the very old topic of resilience, if I uh, use the turn of phrase of NATO's Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg here, it, it also helps uh, NATO to pursue an image of endurance and adaptability, along, of course, with a very particular definition of the Alliance's purpose. And this is where I think it's very useful to recall um, uh, Felix Tutas, who is a Romanian origin um, IR scholar uh, working at the uh, University College London. He's apt reminder that what NATO is and what NATO does today is as much the outcome of NATO repeatedly telling its own story. So in this light, the mantra of resilience, which has indeed become an essential leitmotif of NATO's modern narrative, also enables it to project an image of being a nimble, adjustable, ever relevant global security manager. Indeed, an organization which always is ready for managing and tackling crisis. Now, uh, briefly, where we find uh, the, the uh, resilience architecture, resilience in action uh, uh, at NATO. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, as you very well know, launched this NATO 2030 initiative in June 2020. And this is uh, you know, one of the most recent efforts to prepare the alliance for the future. And the significance of resilience is also an on a predictable component, uh, um, no, it's not an unpredictable component. Sorry, I got my own sentence messed up here. So, so in an unpredictable international security scene is something that is perhaps an inevitable component in the speeches of NATO uh, spokespersons throughout the past years. Institutionally, we can see this commitment uh, to be embodied in these various centers of excellence that have sprung up uh, you know, not least in, in the Baltic region uh, in the late and uh, late 2000s and, and, uh, and early 2010s, but also, you know, in parts of, of uh, old NATO, so to speak, all dedicated to various emerging uh, challenges, uh, which in a way complete institutionally NATO's resilience architecture. NATO 2030 report also advises uh, establishing a center of excellence for democratic resilience, which would be dedicated to providing support to individual allies upon their request for strengthening societal resilience to resist interference from hostile external actors in the functioning of the democratic institutions and processes. And there has been also talk uh, about uh, establishing a new center of excellence on climate and security, which is something that has been an important part of NATO's agenda ever since Jens Stoltenberg's premiership. And now the final uh, question of how uh, the future projected resilience of NATO as embodied in the NATO 2030 initiative indeed stands on three legs. So there is this idea that NATO needs to stay strong militarily. NATO has to be made into a stronger political alliance. And of course, it has to embrace a more global approach towards challenges, which range from the traditional state-sourced kinds, such as the rise of China to, to terrorism, proliferation of nuclear weapons, cyber intrusions, and the like. Now, NATO has, of course, demonstrated some capability in disaster relief and, and civilian support abilities. But it's also pretty evident that its traditional military remit remains still more convincing than uh, its forays into political and economic issues. 
whether we are talking about the screening of investments or a cybersecurity in 5G networks or tackling disinformation. And many experts also uh, actually uh, hesitate whether NATO's current resilience architecture wouldn't actually have difficulties in coping with multiple and simultaneous disruptive uh, events, which of course, you know, again, doesn't take away the political appeal of, of the resilience uh, mantra to emphasize how uh, nice it would be to, to work together for NATO and, and the European Union in tackling all these, all these um, sort of fuzzy, uh, fuzzy threats, hybrid threats, uh, uh, disinformation, cyber uh, and the like. But again, as you well know, the proof of this cooperation remains yet in the pudding. And it's something that emerges from the um, actual practice rather than just well-intentioned speeches. Now, taken together, and this is where I will conclude, NATO's repertoires of resilience pertain both to internal and external risks. So there is this struggle for alliances continuing relevance unity and credibility, which bridges the divide between the two spheres. The resilience logic also converges with that of deterrence, which requires that NATO continuously would demonstrate its own strength to remain credible. Now, if we were to stretch the deterrence template further, NATO's emerging task of resilience, besides its existing essential core tasks of collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security, also entails both general and immediate elements. Whereas general deterrence refers to the anticipation and deterrence of unspecified challengers, general resilience covers NATO's aspiration to bounce back and continue to adapt in light of a host of broadly framed security challenges. But we can also speak about immediate deterrence and concrete resilience, if you will, Immediate deterrence pertaining to the issuing of a specific response to an immediately pressing threat of attack and concrete resilience entailing preparing NATO systems and forces for current and future shocks and disturbances without the necessity of retaliation. And this might, of course, include anything from the continuing functionality of NATO forces and headquarters along with that small of a thing as transatlantic relationship itself. And this is uh, where I shall stop. Thank you very much. Okay, so right there, Maria. I would like to now uh, pass the floor to Andras Ratz, who is going to talk about uh, an issue that has particular importance in the Baltic states, and that is uh, security challenges uh, from the Russian Federation. Uh, Andras, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. There's an interesting dichotomy. Either one wears a secure mask, and the sun doesn't come out, or one is, is exchanging for a lighter mask in which it's easier to speak, but with this one you cannot wear a glass. So basically the choice is you either see things or you can talk about things. Uh, so in this particular case, I choose to talk about things. Uh, so in case you have a question, raise your hand high, because I'm not going to see you. Uh, and what we are going to do now, you know the bad joke, right? visit Russia before it visits you. In some parts of the world, this is funny. In other parts of the world, not much. Uh, so here, what I'm trying to speak about is to demonstrate Russian Federation is posing no security threat to anybody at all. And that's the bad news. And that's the joke. This is the Russian official narrative. If one listens to the communication of the Russian foreign ministry, also sometimes the presidential administration, you hear a lot of things about cooperation, about peaceful, development-oriented cooperation uh, in the energy sphere, in the business sphere, all that. That's the official narrative. And one needs to know the official narrative. When, when you're dealing with a country that's posing uh, security threats, one needs to go close. One needs to have a lot of empathy to the other side. Not sympathy, that's important. You know what's the difference? Sympathy is when you start changing your own mindset. That's too much. Empathy is when you understand the other side and also the internal motivations of the other side, but without actually transfer or transforming your own views. One needs to get close. And, that's, and, and part of it is that, that you need to know of all sort of official narratives. Disclaimer here, everything what I'm going to tell here is solely and exclusively my own personal opinion, okay? 
So it's not rep representing the official position either of the German Council on Foreign Relations or any state or country. This is just solely my own personal opinion. So when we talk about the threats posed by Russia, from the cognitive perspective, it makes sense to make a distinction between military and non-military threats. In the Russian military thinking, this is a highly integrated, Russia has a highly integrated approach. They use military and non-military tools and means uh, in, a, in a very integrated, very coordinated way. But in order to make it understandable for all selves, because in all, in all thinking, military and non-military threats are often separated. Uh, so this is something that, that might need, we, we might need to use at least in the beginning. So when it comes to, to military threats, another distinction that might make sense to make also from, from the cognitive perspective is whether there is a difference between the security situation of NATO countries and, uh, and non-NATO countries. Here, sitting in Latvia, sitting in the Baltic states, uh, NATO has uh, the operation and enhanced forward presence here in the region. Uh, this enhanced forward presence is providing us with a much higher level of security than we had, let's say, in 2014. So one might make, might have kind of a false sense of security. See, NATO battalions are here, what could go wrong? But in reality, if you look just a bit further to the east, dear colleagues, the war in Ukraine has been going on for seven years. This is longer than the Second World War. And it's not somewhere far away in the other side of the world. It's right in the direct neighborhood of Europe. So every time when we think about the security situation and the threats posed by Russia, we always need to have a big red light flashing that the war in Ukraine is still going on. Territories of Ukraine are partially occupied, uh, partially illegally annexed by the Russian Federation. And this is going on right next door. This we need to keep in mind all the time. So when the question comes whether there is a difference between the security situation of NATO countries and non-NATO countries, the answer is yes and no. Of course, in the direct sense, NATO countries are much more secure thanks to the collective defense guarantees, the troops, presence, everything. But from, from a bit, bit broader perspective, because our immediate neighborhoods, our allies and partners are under a direct security threat from the Russian Federation, of course we cannot feel safe and secure, because we aren't. So if we go a bit more uh, into the details, here in the Baltic region, and back when, when the Crimea happened and when, uh, when the, Eastern, the war in Eastern Ukraine started, I was working here in the Baltic region, uh, up in Finland, uh, and also had the opportunity to work together with Estonian colleagues. So I remember the, the early discussions, 2014, 2015. What to do if little green men show up here? The same little green men uh, who, who showed up in, uh, in the Crimea, the same little green men who've been present in Eastern Ukraine, only in plain clothes, plain clothes without markings. Back then the discussion was really about what shall we do if Ru Russia tries to do the same vis-a-vis -vis the Baltic states? You remember, or many of you do remember, back then there were fears that if Russia really moves on against the Baltic states, they could finish up occupying the Baltic territories in 96 hours. Sorry, um, uh, yeah, not 96 hours or, or like 100 hours, basically four days. Would have been way too short time for NATO to react and particularly to protect the Baltic states. Back then the political dilemma was that, okay, if Baltic states get overrun, in a few days' time, and thereafter Russia says that, okay, we stop here. This is what we wanted. We don't want to have a full-scale war with NATO. We got back the Baltic states, but now we stop. Back then, the dilemma was really there whether NATO would have actually been able, in the political sense, to get united uh, for liberating the Baltic states. Back then, 2014, 2015, I could name a few NATO countries uh, in which I couldn't have been fully sure that they would actually vote for, okay, let's go to war with Russia for the sake of Estonia. You are future leaders, some of you are actual leaders. You're coming from democratic countries. You have to think about how your own voters would perceive. Imagine selling your voters, explaining your voters that, okay, there's a small NATO country, let's leave it there. Uh, there are small NATO countries up in the Baltic states, thousands of kilometers away from our own country. Uh, so let's go to war, in, war against Russia for the sake of these Baltic states. 
this wouldn't have been easy to explain. And this is the calculus what enhanced forward presence is actually changing. NATO enhanced forward presence saw the four battalions, three in the three Baltic states and one in Poland. Militarily, this is not a significant force. Militarily, these forces pose no threat to the Russian Federation. I mean, solely Russia's Western military district. So the Russian military district neighboring the Baltic states, that's more than, more than 100,000 soldiers, including Russia's best special operation forces, best uh, mechanized infantry and, ta and, and, and tank units. Four NATO battalions pose no military threat to them. So why are they keeping, or, or, why are they keeping us secure? The logic is called, and I'm sure you heard the concept, it's called tripwire concept. You know, like with the landmine. You step on a tripwire, so you activate the mine. The logic is the same. Had Russia, if Russia decides to overrun the Baltic states, they won't, but if. They could not do it without killing a large number of NATO soldiers, which would surely provide the necessary coherence of the alliance between let's standing up and liberate the Baltic states. So the, the, the logic behind the enhanced forward presence is this very tripwire concept. And actually, it puts the escalation dilemma on the Russian side. Because earlier, 2014, 2015, the question, as we said before, the question was, shall we go to war against Russia for the sake of Estonia or, or Latvia or Lithuania? Right now, with NATO forces here, the dilemma is on the Russian side. Shall we go to war against NATO for the sake of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania? And the Russian answer is probably no. That's the good news here. So enhanced forward presence is, is providing us with a high level of, of, uh, of military security. Also, not because from, only from the NATO side, also from the Russian side. Try to think with Russia's heads. Imagine the map of Russia, OK? And let's just go across or along Russia's borders, starting from the east. In the east, Russia is bordering China, a country 10 times larger uh, or even more than 10 times larger, with massive economic superiority and militarily also catching up. Probably there is also already military superiority on the Chinese side, except of nuclear weapons. So China is not an easy neighbor. Mongolia is, is, uh, is an easy one, but, but the big problem there in the east for, for Russia is China and the growing ambitions and, and capabilities of China just going to make this problem worse. Don't believe the narratives about Russia-China partnership. There is occasional cooperation along shared interest, but no trust at all. And I'm happy to elaborate that uh, on that should some questions arise. So let's go further westwards. Russia is neighboring the Central Asian region. Central Asian region composed of largely authoritarian countries marred by, uh, by ethnic conflicts, let's say Uzbek, Tajik, Kyrgyz, Uzbek, all that, plus succession problems. And since August this year, on the south of the Central Asia region, the whole Afghan collapse and the return of the Taliban. For Russia, this is posing a massive imminent security challenge. They, they themselves also do not know how, what exactly is going to be the outcome, how to address all that. Let's go further west, the North Caucasian, South Caucasian region. The countries of the South Caucasus there, in the last 20 years, there have been a civil war in Georgia in the early 1990s. Separatist conflict between Abkhazia and Georgia, separatist conflict in, uh, in between Abkhazia and South, uh, sorry, South Ossetia and, uh, and also Georgia, so early 90s. 2008, the war in Georgia. 2016, the short war between Azerbaijan and Armenia. 2020, the longer war between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And all this unstable region is neighboring Russia's most unstable North Caucasian regions. Yes, Ramzan Kadyrov more or less stabilized Chechnya. But the price is, or the price has been, that radical Islam and radical Islamists have been pushed to the neighboring Dagestan, also in Gushetia, all the other regions. So Russia's North Caucasus region is, is not stable at all. It's not a coincidence that really many, many highly combat-capable Russia units are regularly stationed in the neighborhood of, of the North Caucasus. Yes, five minutes. And going further east, sorry, further west, there is a war going on against Ukraine for seven years. From this perspective, 
the western border of the Russian Federation is actually the most stable one of all the ones that Russia has. Russia is not preparing for, for a full-scale armed conflict against the West. This is not their plan A. Mm. Yes, they are exercising for it. Because every military is preparing for worst-case scenarios. The recent Zapa 2021 exercise demonstrated how the capabilities of the Russian armed forces have been improving. Uh, but still, the plan A is not, uh, not to go to war, war against the West. Still, we need to be ready because they, are, they themselves are preparing themselves. One word on the Russian super weapons, the hypersonic weapons, all that. They are not a game changer. There's a lot of information dimension boosting their visibility and, and picturing them as some kind of a Wunderwaffe. No, they are not game changers. They are about maintaining Russia's second, second strike capability, maintaining the balance, nothing more. If one reads the actual new national security strategy of Russia adopted this summer, it clearly states that NATO is posing no direct security threat to Russia. But this doesn't mean that relations are good. The absence of a direct security threat, an imminent military danger, it doesn't mean that we'd be safe. For non-NATO countries, or against non-NATO countries actually, Russia is actively using its military. Again, the war in Ukraine, the occupied territories of Georgia, Russian forces in Syria changing the, 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 the tide of the war. Russian forces there in Libya, Russian private military contractors projecting Russian power all over in Africa. This doesn't look good at all. Against NATO countries, the picture is a bit different. Russia is using its military, but for political purposes. It's using its military to put information pressure on us, um, basically kind of use exercise deterrence. There is one Russian term useful to know. Some of the colleagues here to speak Russian. In Russian military thinking, there's a term, information deterrence. If I speak credibly enough about attacking you, I might coerce you to do certain things without actually attacking you, simply because the information effect has a deterrent, because the information has a deterrent effect on you. Russia is using its military for these purposes. And when it comes to resilience, Russia is using a smart combination of non-military means against the West. What are the objectives? Weaken the coherence of the West, both the EU and NATO. Prevent or soften the adoption of newer sanctions. Here in the Baltic region, prevent the NATO accession of Finland and Sweden. From Russia's perspective, that would be a disaster. And also to make it harder for NATO to deploy further forces and bases here in the Baltic region. And the tools and means, one minute, two minutes, great. For the tools and means, besides using military for political purposes, Russia has been actively relying on, on a combination of information and cyber means for election interference, for political campaigns, for plenty of campaigns of disinformation and misinformation, as Louis rightly pointed out. This is not going to go away. Russian intelligence operations have become a lot more aggressive since 2014 than they were before. And this is not only about recruitment and intelligence gathering. This is also about targeted killings. Remember the Skripal case. This is also about sabotage. Remember the Czech case in Vrbetice, the ammunition depot, a lot of other things. And Russia is using, and that's my last point, massive systemic corruption efforts against Western decision makers. And this is a highly efficient tool in Moscow's hands. There are classic bribes. You know, you let me access to your computer in order I pay you nice amounts of cash. That's a classic bribe. Here, here when you can combine corruption with intelligence gathering, right? And there is a much more dangerous type, which is called revolving door corruption. Revolving door corruption is that I'm an official. I do a favor for the Russian Federation or for Gazprom, Ros Rosneft, RGD, whatever. And when my political mandate ends, then I get a nice job in Russia. It's not only about Gerhard Schröder. Yes, in Russian political terminology, there is the word Schröderizatia. Mm -hmm. It's not only about Gerhard Schröder. <coughs> Former Austrian foreign minister, Karin Kneisel, she became member of the board of, uh, of Rosneft. Her boss is actually, uh, is actually Schröder. There are three Austrian chancellors, former chancellors, working for Russian companies. And we could name a lot of, a lot of other examples from Central and Eastern Europe. Plus, of course, 
Russia is happily using economic and energy means to put pressure on us. Right now, the decrease in gas supplies are used in order to get the license for Nord Stream 2. Bad news, really final sentence. From Russia's perspective, dear colleagues, all these tools and means have been mostly efficient. Costs are minimal. They reached a lot of their desired objectives. There is no reason for Russia to stop. So far, they've been largely successful. Why would they stop? So there is a grave need for, for maintained awareness for resilience, and there's a great need for, for your job in this field. Thank you. Thank you, Andras. Uh, it's always hard as the moderator's chair to interrupt uh, such yep. nice discussions, but uh, we, uh, we unfortunately have a timetable, but there will be plenty of time uh, for Q&A. So we will now turn to our final uh, panelist, Alexandra, uh, who's talking about something else that is of fundamental importance to the security regime, not only of the EU, but also to the NATO alliance, and that is uh, relationship with, with China. So Alexandra, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Liz. First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to the prestigious event. Uh, my intention is to uh, give you some uh, points, some general, uh, general uh, uh, a description of um, EU-China relations. It is a very broad topic, so uh, so. I, um, my aim is to describe broadly um, European Union Russia, uh, Euro, sorry, European Union China relations, then I move to Central and Eastern European uh, region and uh, give you some, some points, uh, some particulars about um, uh, the relations. Uh, talking about um, European Union China relations, we have to start from um, 19. Uh, 75, because, uh, be when the official diplomatic relations uh, between the uh, European Union and China uh, was established. Uh, since then, uh, the cooperation starts to be more uh, institutionalized. Uh, currently, we've got an um, annual summit. Uh, we've got uh, regular ministerial meetings and uh, sectoral um, cooperations. Um, um, you can, uh, we, we can mention uh, several dimensions of, of the cooperation, uh, such as uh, climate change, um, uh, joint um, attitude towards uh, um, Iran and North Korea, um, North Korea's uh, um, nuclear policy, um, global governance and multinational, uh, multi, uh, multinational, uh, international um, uh, organizations. So, as you can see, there are a lot of uh, a lot of dimension, um, and in the, those particular cases, uh, European Union and China share the, the similar uh, point of view. Um, additionally, it is economy, which is one of the most or even the most important uh, fields of cooperation. European Union and uh, China are um, each other the largest uh, trade market, market. Uh, but it is not, uh, um, it is not uh, um, compl uh, complementary uh, relation, but rather competition. Uh, more experts uh, pay attention that uh, many experts pay attention and pay uh, attention that uh, China is uh, interested in uh, um, South uh, South Africa's and Latin America's markets, uh, and the European Union uh, is interested uh, in the, those regions as well. So, uh, as you can see, it's uh, some kind of competition, or we may, uh, we may uh, perceive it uh, as a competition. Uh, Lee Xing, who is uh, an author of uh, several books and articles devoted to China and European Union uh, relation, uh, call it, um, calls it uh, riverly, uh, systemic riverly, than, uh, rather than uh, strategic uh, cooperation. So uh, it is, uh, it is, I would say, uh, a new uh, perspective uh, on China. Um, um, analyzing uh, EU-China relations, we have to remember that uh, there are several uh, 
several uh, intersections, uh, several intersections, uh, and uh, different political actors we, uh, which influence uh, those relations. Uh, it is obviously uh, United uh, United States. And we have to analyze uh, bilateral relation between the European Union and China in context of uh, in context of uh, hostile relation between the United States and uh, and uh, China. Uh, it is uh, war trade. Uh, it is uh, there are hostile relations uh, above all. Uh, and. Um, Generally speaking, uh, members of European Union uh, are similar uh, when, you're, when we talk about uh, attitude toward United uh, States. They, uh, generally speaking, they recognize the United States as a main uh, guarantor of their stability, sovereignty, particularly in military context. So it is. Uh, Unbelievable that they uh, would choose China rather than uh, United States in context of, of uh, their security. Um, there is uh, obviously there is Russia, uh, which uh, which uh, uh, influenced the European Union um, China relations, and I agree with uh, Andras that this is not a partnership. I mean China and Russia, but rather. Um, Mm, cooperation in particular fields, for example, military, um, it is uh, it is significant, uh, particularly for Central and Eastern European countries, such as uh, the Baltic state, um, because of um, military cooperation, for example, in the Baltic Sea region and Arctic. Mm, so those countries uh, start to uh, perceive China. Uh, China-Russia cooperation uh, for the prism of, of um, uh, some kind of uh, security issues. Um, we've got uh, we've got uh, Taiwan, uh, and um, it is also interesting that uh, there is some some kind of uh, uh, phenomenon that. Uh, some countries can even uh, choose uh, uh, relation uh, with Taiwan rather than uh, China. Uh, currently, uh, um, diplomatic relation with China means that there is no, uh, dipl uh, no, no diplomatic relation with uh, Taiwan. So as you can see, there are several different uh, dimensions, several different uh, foreign actors which influence uh, European Union-China uh, relations. Um, and what is important in my perspective is that there is no, uh, the, the um, uh, European Union uh, hasn't got a unified voice uh, towards China. I mean, there are so many different uh, attitudes towards, uh, towards uh, uh, China. Um, uh, um, devoted to uh, devoted to te Chinese technology, uh, economy, a market, uh, or even human rights. Um, and uh, now I'd like to uh, move to Central and European, uh, Central and Cent Central and Eastern European countries to show you how how it looks like um, uh, when we move to uh, some particularities. Um, and it is uh, worth mentioning um, 16 plus 1 initiative, which was launched in um, 2012. Uh, then in 2019, it transformed into a 70 plus 1 initiative because Greece uh, joined the platform. But, uh, but a few months ago, Lithuania left uh, the format because of uh, security, uh, security issues. So, uh, so now we uh, we we um, we've got uh, initiative 16 plus one, I would say, <laughs> uh, initiative. Uh, uh, it is it is a very interesting format, uh, format of cooperation uh, between Central and Eastern European countries and China. Um, 
it should be uh, it should be underlined that um, those countries uh, several times the countries uh, on expressed their their engagement their uh, willingness to cooperate with uh, china they were interested in um, uh, in uh, export, uh, in export, uh, selling their goods to Chinese uh, market, um, they were interested in um, transport, it's infrastructure project, transport and transit, and there was uh, there were several expectations of of uh, this uh, format. Uh, additionally, there is a Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which is also a very important project uh, for uh, both for China and, and Central and Eastern European countries. But as I said before, uh, it is a very complex situation because uh, the countries from this region are not unified. They are very uh, different in uh, attitude towards China. Uh, some of them, I mean, when you look at the uh, 16 plus 1 initiative, there are countries which are the member of the European Union, but uh, some of them are not. Uh, they are um, divided uh, in terms of size, in terms of uh, economy or demographic potential. Uh, and uh, some of them perceive China not for the prism of economy, but for the prism of security. Uh, so I think that it is very interesting, uh, interesting situation, particularly when we move to the Baltic states. Uh, I said that Lithuania left uh, 16 plus, uh, 70 plus one uh, initiative because of security threats. Um, and what is also interesting that, uh, I mean, nine, uh, nine years after uh, this, this initiative was launched, we can uh, analyze or evaluate the effectiveness of this platform. And some of, some of the countries, particularly the Visegrad countries, Poland, um, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary, they, uh, at the beginning, they, uh, their expectations were very high. And that now, they are quite disappointed and even frustrated because uh, they haven't, uh, their export uh, uh, hasn't been uh, so, thank you. Um, didn't increase, so so uh, so now they now now they they, uh, they are thinking about the the, fu the future of this initiative. Um, uh, and uh, there are a lot of uh, security challenges, such as uh, um, such as uh, Chinese technology. Um, in the Baltic states, uh, there are several several security reports which uh, mention that there are uh, Chinese uh, espionage in in the Baltic states. That uh, uh, there is military uh, cooperation between China and Russia. Um, there is uh, mm, there is. Uh, mm, Cultural, uh, cultural um, influence of, of uh, Chinese diplomats or even university, uh, universities um, in the Baltic states. So, so uh, I would say that uh, uh, we um, we have to uh, bear in mind that there is not uh, we have to uh, we have to remember not uh, only about. Uh, uh, positives of, of uh, the positive side of the cooperation, but also about uh, security and challenges. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Alexandra. That was uh, a very needed and informative talk. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot of interesting questions um, because this is indeed one of the premier challenges faced by the alliance is the rise of uh, China and how to deal with the multifaceted security threats, not just with, with the Russian Federation, but indeed with China. So uh, we have until 11.30, so we have a fairly decent time for questions. I would like to open up the floor uh, to the audience. Please uh, state your name and your affiliation, and then uh, whoever you would like to ask the question to. And I think we'll just uh, take a couple of hands from the audience. I saw, I believe, Dylan and Ra no? Rahel, uh, please. Uh, hi, Gina. my name is 
Uh, I'm Officer Kellett uh, at the Bundeswehr. Um, so my question is to Mr. Raj. Uh, I found very interesting what you said about the Russian PSYOPs and uh, information operation. And uh, my question is like, how can NATO effectively counter these operations? Um, given the fact that we are not allowed to target our own uh, population, we are not allowed to analyze them, and we are also not allowed to disseminate grey or black propaganda. Thank you. Maybe we'll do three at a time. So Donatas is the second. Uh, to Donatas. Hello, uh, my name is Donatas. I am representing Baltic Institute of Advanced uh, Technology, and I actually have several questions, but I will ask only one, and then if there's time, uh, please come back to me. So I have a question for the first speaking uh, speaker. Uh, so seeking uh, resilient society, there's a few important elements. So one is that people would trust their societies. Second is that uh, People would think uh, critically about the information that they uh, are receiving. And uh, for this are responsible uh, educational people and social policy people. So Mike, uh, and mostly the, this does not depend on security experts. So uh, how, so I want to ask, what would be the correct uh, cooperation model between security people and social and education? Uh, people and how much security people should go into these spheres. And if we could, yep, Crystal. Uh, Crystal uh, Tohu has a question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Crystal. I'm from uh, Tartu, University of Tartu. So I have a question for, uh, for Maria. Uh, so about the resilience, so I wanted to ask that, uh, do you think that developing resilience is a way of, for, uh, is a way of survival for NATO by the means of keeping the cooperation between members and staying credible in the eyes of the rest of the world? So this is my question. Thank you. Okay, well, let's give the participants a, a chance to answer them in, in the order that they were asked. All right, uh, thank you. Can you understand me with this mask or shall I switch back? You're good. Yeah. Okay, good, great. Uh, thank you for the very easy question. It's a, a million dollar one, right? <laughs> uh, how can NATO efficiently counter cyber and psyops? Particularly taking into account the very restrictive regulatory environment that we have in some NATO countries. First and foremost, regulatory environment is not the same everywhere. The German regulatory environment is much more strict than, let's say, the Czech one, the Slovak one, or the Baltic ones, regarding monitoring one's own population, regarding actively countering, let's say, disinformation agents or information agents working for somebody else. So in this perspective, the different re uh, regulatory environments provide some freedom of movement, also in the sense of international cooperation. If one NATO country is not allowed to monitor its own population, should the given NATO country receive information from an allied country about its own population, that one already works. For example, this is one way. So if you get information about your own population from an allied country, if let's say, if let's say your own citizen does something nasty in the information field in another NATO country, then you're allowed to act. Second thing, most important, is awareness. Because even, even though the war in Ukraine has been going on for seven years, and the level of awareness improved a lot about information and psyops, and how Russia is using all that, still we are in a critically vulnerable situation. Simply we just still don't know enough. Not you, not the expert community, but let's say the journalists. Give you a fun fact. In many EU countries, we still call people working for Russia Sputnik news agency as journalists. Has anybody of you read the founding document of Sputnik? It's public. It's a Russian presidential decree dated 9th of December 2013. Uh, it's a Russian presidential decree which created the agency Russia Sivodnya, 
under to which Sputnik is subordinated. This very document, a presidential decree, drop me a line, I can send it to you, it's really public. Point four, point A of this decree, uh, second page on the top, it clearly states that the task of the agency is to represent the state policies of the Russian Federation abroad. This is not a news agency. It calls itself a news agency, but even its own public document states the opposite. Why are we still calling Sputnik people as journalists? I honestly don't understand. There is a lot of, thing, a lot of things in that field of awareness that we can still do. Third, technology. Russians are not omnipotent. They have problems in producing disinformation content, particularly on the smaller languages. Yes, we know how the networks operate. We know that the, the central narratives are defined in Moscow. Then they are sent out to the local information agents, mostly in English. Then they get translated, particularly again to the smaller languages, by the local agents. And then they are getting spread in the local information environments. But the channels they are using for spreading this information, Facebook, Twitter, I mean, in the field of social media, we can do a lot. And Facebook has been doing a lot. Personally, I think not yet enough, but still a lot in order to counter the spread of this information. Paradoxically enough, COVID helped a lot because COVID motivated Facebook to act, to step up more actively against various types of disinformation. Twitter has been highly efficient in shooting down automated botnets. Millions of Twitter accounts spreading same narratives. So in the field of technology, we can deprive the adversary of the channels it has been using. Not fully, not completely, but we can weaken them a lot. There is one channel, however, which is very hard to address. And this one is something very popular, particularly among the elderly generation. Dear colleagues, chain emails. Emails forwarded by one people to another people, spreading false narratives about a lot of things. Chain emails are very hard even to detect because they go from one personal mailbox to another personal mailbox. This is something quite hard to, 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 to act against. Plus, uh, one more thing about regulatory environment. What's the future of disinformation? What's the most dangerous form of disinformation that is already getting used and will be used a lot more? Deep fake. Because against deep fake, I don't really see that we would be resilient. And we are quite lucky because the other side is not yet using deep fake, mostly because they themselves are not resilient against deep fake either. Mm -hmm. But how Russia functions, how Russians work in this field, first, they always build up their own defense. And once they are secure against a given type of threat, then they go offensive. Right now, they are building up their own threats against deep fake. Once they are done with that, they will go offensive with that because there is no reason for them not to do so. We really need to think about how to counter deep fake. Technology is one option. Regulatory environment is also another option. For example, based on, 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 on copyright approaches. And one more thing, and here I stop. How to deprive disinformation channels from the money, they, for, uh, how to make it more expensive. Slovak colleagues had a genius idea a few years ago. Uh, they set up a website, Desinformatie or Conspiratory, something like this. The, the, the idea is, that on many disinformation websites, you know, there are Google ads running. That's how the websites are functioned, are, are, are financed. Sorry, that's how the websites, websites are financed. And what Slovak colleagues did, they approached the big companies whose advertisements are running there. Dear Mr. BMW, are you aware that your advertisements are running on this and that disinformation website? And of course, the PR department said, oh, Jesus. So they told Google that please take down the ads from there. By this way, actually, yes, naming and shaming, it's called. Mm -hmm. By labeling a website as a disinformation website, you can convince big, advertisement, big advertisers not to advertise there. Mm -hmm. You won't stop the functioning of the website, but you can make it a lot, a lot more expensive for the adversary. That's also a tool and mean. And there is a lot to learn from, from many, 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 many countries here in, here in Europe. Some countries have genius ideas. Slovaks have this one. Estonians have pretty good technological solutions. There are a lot of things we can do. Again, I think the key point is awareness. We need to be aware that, yes, we need to act. I hope this is an answer. 
Well, thank you for tackling such a complex question in such a short time with a very detailed answer. That was an exceptional answer. Maria, I believe there are some questions directed your way. Thanks very much. And I believe these questions are also very much related. So the question about how much should security organizations, traditional security organizations or security people, as you asked Donatas, go into these uh, spheres that are more in between and that actually traditionally have belonged more to to uh, you know either the national competences or or as you said you know people working in education raising critical awareness uh, how much should the cooperation uh, take place uh, uh, when it comes to nato and 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 these other uh, other people so to speak and other other organizations i mean it's already taking place Right when we think of, uh, for instance, in this hybrid sphere and and the Helsinki uh, Center, European Center of Excellence uh, for countering hybrid threats, but obviously the very question also I think probes uh, something that NATO, as I you know suggested via this uh, Woody Allen's uh, Celic reference, has been actually very uh, prominent and and famous for its ability to adapt. And this is, I think, very rightly emphasized by, by the spokespeople of, of NATO uh, through, through the time, actually, because NATO has been really pretty congenial in adapting and, and in that sense also transforming to the vibe of time or, or a little bit dark. So, so, I mean, NATO, obviously, its strength, uh, I mean, at the core, it remains a military machine, right? But it uh, has taken uh, great care, uh, particularly post-Cold War, uh, but also, you know, all these other phases that came post-Post-Cold War to make sure that it wouldn't come across as a sort of dull military machine, that it would also be very savvy in terms of uh, understanding security comprehensively. Now, as I suggested, resources obviously are not uh, infinite. And, uh, and um, one, in that sense, needs to pick and choose who does the job. And, and, and this is why I think, you know, this uh, area, by and large, it's important for NATO, obviously, to acknowledge this. But I'm less convinced whether this might uh, not be something that is, uh, you know, indeed, uh, good to raise awareness about continuously, but not maybe necessarily make it, uh, you know, a, a practical uh, political mission for the alliance, uh, per se, because this is something where indeed NATO and the EU can, can fruitfully collaborate, and, and it's probably more in the, you know, national as well as the EU competence than in the uh, sort of actual uh, uh, existing strengths of, of NATO. Uh, right now. And now coming to the question of, uh, of Crystal, is it a means of survival uh, for NATO, this, this uh, resilience mantra? And this is a very good question. And I think it's also, uh, I think it, it goes straight to, uh, to this uh, distinction that we need to keep in mind, uh, albeit, you know, we can argue whether that is a distinction. Uh, but uh, the standard traditional understanding of security that pertains to sort of physical survival and that has very material uh, components um, to it. And then this idea of, of uh, also surviving as a certain sort of a being. So this is uh, very important for the survival of uh, the resilience mantra. It's very important for the survival of NATO's uh, self-identity as a, you know, flexible, continuously uh, adapting, nimble organization in that sense. Yes, but that's, that's less about its, uh, its sort of uh, material, physical survival, if you will. So that is the distinction between security, traditionally understood security as survival, physical security, if you will, and then ontological security the security of the self, the security of a particular, you know, type of, of being and, and, and the ability to sort of sustain a self-narrative uh, throughout time, uh, more or less. So I'd say it's rather more the resilience in that case uh, is, is for NATO less about survival in the physical sense of the term and more about, you know, NATO's continuing relevance. NATO's legitimacy, and also uh, obviously something that is not to be underestimated at the individual, but also at the sort of crown institutional levels, 
every actor always appreciates the ability to feel good about themselves and uh, and you know being uh, resilient and also being able to showcase one's resilience definitely contributes to that feel good factor or positive sense of self for the alliance thanks Thank you, uh, Maria. Uh, so I see we have three questions. We have two from the online cohort, and then uh, Dylan is requesting the microphone, uh, followed by, by Michael. I would like to let our online colleagues go first. I see two hands. Uh, let's give the floor first to, to the lady. I can't see your name, and your, uh, your icon is up. And followed by uh, Iverson next, then Dylan, and then, and then Michael. Yes, thank you for giving me the online mic. Um, my question is this, external uh, threats and security issues are very important, but what about the internal fragmentation of NATO? Um, would you, do you think this could impact the military alliance of the countries? Should it be addressed? Has it been addressed? Uh, it's a question who whoever could answer it thank you so much okay over to iverson i saw you had a hand up yeah hello everyone uh i am a uh, columnist uh, working at uh, the estonian newspaper post -Dimes. and i've got a question to maria uh data so i would like to address uh, the issue that you have brought up regarding resilience institutional endurance and the rise of china as a system uh systemic rival so in particular, I would like to talk about, uh, ask about how um, NATO would respond to uh, the Chinese aggressive base via uh, in terms of uh, ruining the, the rule of law in Hong Kong uh, and how it uh, tackles the critical infrastructure um, in, in different NATO members, uh, as well as um, how this um, issue with the people to people context were split up by China regarding the 16 uh, plus, fun, uh, plus one uh, format. Uh, if I can uh, elaborate a little bit further uh, within context is that uh, so recently, not recently, actually in the beginning of this year, uh, some Danish politicians, they were threatened by the Hong Kong police uh, within the provision of the Hong Kong National Security Law Article 38 because it is uh, extraterritorial in nature. So anyone who committed this so-called offense when they go to Hong Kong or mainland China, they will get arrested. So this is the context. And as for critical infrastructure, we have got the uh, Helsinki uh, tunnel. So which is like a bridge, uh, a tunnel between Tallinn and Helsinki. And uh, it was reported that uh, we have got a Chinese uh, private company uh, funding 10 billion US dollars. And, and it is affiliated to a uh, Chinese state-owned uh, company, which is owned by the Chinese Communist Party. Then last but not least, uh, regarding the issue of the people to people context, we've got the 16 plus one format. And uh, the implication is that um, Hungary, being part of that format, they have uh, blocked uh, the resolution in the European Council uh, regarding the crackdown on Hong Kong. So my question is, how would you um, suggest or uh, what are your thoughts about the NATO, uh, NATO uh, resilience and institutional uh, uh, and endurance uh, would be able to or capable to respond to the uh, multifaceted uh, Chinese threat as a systemic rival. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm Dylan Crossan from the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. I work as a research assistant in the Foreign Policy Unit. Um, I was uh, I wanted to come back to Maria's uh, second to last point about the division of labor within NATO and the EU, um, and resilience versus uh, collective defense. Um, I do, I, I guess, as a Brussels-based think tanker, appreciate uh, recognition. I suppose that the EU might um, have more uh, might have resilience more in its DNA than um, than NATO. Um, I also believe that resilience is more of an EU concept to begin with. I, I think it was even you know, brought into strategic discourse by the global strategy. Um, and, and I think that um, the, the challenge of resilience has also to do with um, something that the previous, uh, what, what was her name, Louis? Um, the, pr the first question? On the screen. Well, in any I, case, I, I the first, that. yeah, the first question, um, talking about you know domestic politics, um, there is also there's also a challenge of skepticism, skepticism, vis-a-vis -vis NATO, 
Um, many, many countries don't believe that NATO will be there. There's also um, the question, I think, that Alexandra underlined very well, of uh, linkages in the economic sphere that prevent a coherent position from being taken. Um, so I, I, was, I was also wondering if you could maybe elaborate on um, domestic politics, skepticism, um, economic linkages. And I had a short follow-up question with, uh, for Alexandra about um, whether you see a role for NATO in China or with China. Um, I personally would decouple NATO from China completely, um, but I was wondering if you have a different opinion. And finally, we'll give the mic to Michael. You had a question? Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Richter. I'm currently a doctoral researcher at the Research Center for East European Studies at the University of Bremen and a visiting scholar at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, the SWP in Brussels. And my question would refer to something we can all see when we look out, the speakers won't see it, but next to the Latvian flag, we see the EU flag next to the Belarusian oppositional flag as a symbol of solidarity. And my question would mostly refer to Mr. Raj, because it refers to the development of scenarios in Belarus. I know the, let's say, bandwidth of potential scenarios is very, very broad, right? It's very hard to basically predict things. It's very hard to say how things will look like in five years. And uh, they, can, they could range from the opposition winning, they could range for, to, towards total incorporation of Belarus into the Russian Federation becoming a next oblast. But my question would be, which scenario do you think, on the one hand, is most likely? I know it's a very difficult probably question. On the other hand, which scenario would be the worst case scenario for NATO and why? And how would it affect actually NATO or let's say the European security infrastructure? I'm referring uh, to one aspect. I know that the Russian Federation was opting very, very loudly for many years for an air base in Belarus. And the question is, would this house somehow affect our security infrastructure? And could we imagine an even worse development? This is basically the question about the worst case scenario for us. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, speakers. Uh, okay, so uh, I uh, thank you very much for question. I, um, I feel that uh, those questions are quite similar, so I try to probably uh, answer it. Uh, they, they both, they touched the, the question about the NATO strategy towards China, how to react to the uh, to the challenges and first of all I would uh, I would pay your attention that it it would be quite difficult to um, maintain or even to create a common strategy toward China because uh, because as I said at the beginning it's not only about uh, about security challenge but the case of cooperation and the, the states are deeply engaged in uh, maintaining economic uh, cooperation, cooperation with China. Uh, but uh, it is a question of how to, uh, how to separate politics from economy. And I would say that it, is, uh, it would be impossible because on the other hand, European Union European Union, uh, I mean, the countries, uh, the countries, uh, NATO, European Union, uh, possess themselves as, uh, uh, as a normative power. They, they, um, they are engaged in, um, um, they, they support uh, democracy. They pay attention on, uh, pay attention to uh, democratic rules and human rights in China. On the other hand, uh, they, they are, um, Mm, uh, they are uh, afraid of, of um, military or even uh, uh, economic pressure from China. And uh, the, the question uh, uh, how to answer the threats from China is, uh, I mean, it's quite hard to, to answer uh, because the influence of China is uh, multidimensional because it, Mm, there is uh, not only economy, uh, military, but also uh, information. So first of all, uh, NATO should uh, develop common uh, common voice towards uh, towards uh, China. And in my opinion, it's it's uh, quite difficult um, uh, because of different uh, different interests uh, among uh, among the countries. Uh, Mm, uh, what is uh, what is important, in my opinion, is that uh, NATO uh, so far uh, uh, 
pay, uh, pay much attention to, to Chinese uh, um, to, to Chinese uh, interference into the, the region. So, uh, so uh, I think that it is uh, uh, it is the first step uh, that that it is uh, Chinese uh, China's uh, threat was included into uh, into the agenda of, of NATO. But how to uh, elaborate the common strategy? Uh, I, I would say that is quite uh, difficult to answer. Uh, um, uh, first of all, we have to uh, be aware that it is a uh, multinational uh, risk, multinational uh, challenge, uh, and um, um, uh, each country can uh, perceive this uh, threat uh, differently. Uh, and there is uh, uh, state uh, level, which is very very important, not only uh, NATO level, but but uh, independent uh, um, state uh, strategy towards uh, China. So uh, I, I would say that that uh, there's a question of how to uh, connect uh, connect or or. Uh, um, Connect uh, government and strategy to China and and uh, NATO uh, strategy. Thank you. Maria, sure. Maria, I believe. Okay, happy to go next. Thank you very much again for the questions. Um, I mean, this internal fragmentation uh, is, is something that is obviously a real problem if you have an alliance of the size, right? And, uh, and also of the histories, uh, which are different, of the sort of uh, differences in the immediacies uh, of, of what threat is really burning and what, what is really urgent and whatnot. So, so there, is, you know, there is the basic play as well as a trade-off for each you know, allied member to, to um, participate in the game of solidarity as well, right? Because, because obviously what burns more for the bolts doesn't, doesn't burn equally uh, uh, strongly for, for Italy or, or, or even you know, German, politically speaking. So this is also obviously something that all this resilience talk in NATO's case very much take uh, takes into consideration. Now, on the practical level, um, I mean, I think we can think of two, two sort of specific issues here. One is obviously the, uh, the uh, occasionally recurring talk about uh, European strategic autonomy and, and uh, how, uh, you know, that is in itself an indication of also this, this from NATO's perspective, of the certain internal fragmentation. Uh, you know, there might be good arguments for it, uh, but, but, you know, there is still, I would say, after many years of this idea being uh, uh, flown around, I'd say not enough clarity in terms of uh, duplication issue, which is, which is a crucial issue, right? So, so in, in that sense, it becomes a bit of a, you know, self-fulfilling um, prophecy, which is not necessarily helping in terms of uh, if you if you want to speak in the language of signaling, then then signaling that, you know, all is well in the in the NATO space. Right. Uh, this is one thing. But on a more positive side, perhaps, uh, I mean, coming to this example uh, and this practical NATO presence that is very much more palpable now in the Baltic uh, region than it uh, was for the best part of the post enlargement uh, time. Uh, namely enhanced forward presence, something that Andras uh, spoke about. I mean, this uh, one could also make an argument is an instance of NATO coming together, uh, you know, on an actual uh, uh, challenge uh, very quickly, actually, and, uh, and rather efficiently, you know, if militarily, symbolically, right? So in that sense, one could also say that if post-enlargement, post, uh, you know, 2004, in the Baltic case and, and 1999 in the Poland's case, we could speak about old and new NATO still sort of occupying different rooms in the house of NATO in the military substance of the uh, collective defense guarantee. Then this is now something that has changed. This, this sort of talk about you know, NATO being effectively a multi-tier affair 
uh, doesn't really hold uh, at least you know there is so much more substance to to uh, to things having become more even and more equalized in that regard so you know as as ever life is a mixed bag right uh, but i think when we talk about working politically speaking on you know the challenge of internal fragmentation and and the challenge of you know all these different uh, domestic politics this is this is also from the alliance's perspective um, a process i mean you know you you will never have nor has there ever been a sort of ideal uh, homogeneous thing called uh, you know nato that always thinks and acts uh, uh, in unison, but I guess the key thing is is indeed the sort of uh, the sort of common sensibility uh, and indeed the core sort of values, which brings us to this this uh, question of China that uh, Iverson you uh, you asked, uh, and I'm you know uh, not an expert, and I think we got already an, uh, a better uh, better introduction to some of the layers of the theme here. But I think that's uh, that's very much the big next question for NATO, because this is also where we see, in a way, the the way NATO's agenda uh, can be shaped and has been very fundamentally shaped by the U.S. political uh, leads and initiative. Because, in a way, you could say that China, uh, as a multifaceted systemic challenge, as you very rightly put it. Um, you know, to to the Western uh, well space and, and and values, and and of course not not least to to the United States uh, hegemony, uh, globally speaking. I mean, this is something that is very much a late comer actually in NATO's agenda, right? And and it's it's only seeping there, it's only emerging there, and it's something that has been pushed into NATO's agenda. Uh, by by the uh, United States, so I think these 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 issues that you raise they are obviously very important and and uh, perhaps you know on the practical uh, level of analysis it's easier to to respond about these sort of you know say critical infrastructure challenges and these are more easily acknowledged but the political normative issues of uh, you know what will NATO actually do what what is it willing to do as a collective body in terms of uh, standing up for Hong Kong. I don't have an answer uh, in that sense. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, this is where the values are at stake. Yes, but but uh, but I'm um, you know, I'm also old enough and and sort of uh, I guess um, uh, sort of pragmatic in that sense that I'm not too optimistic that it will become a huge huge uh, sort of political stake. Uh, that that NATO will actually uh, fight over. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we can go to five past. So I did see another hand. Uh, Enya, you wanted to ask a question? Shall I answer the one on, on Belarus? Ah, yes, that's right. Uh, quickly, uh, Andres, sure. you can answer very, later. Very, and, uh, very quickly, just a few, really just a few to the point sentences. And if you're interested in detail, I can elaborate more. Uh, you had two questions. What scenario is the most likely one in Belarus and which scenario would be the worst for NATO? When it comes to the most likely scenario, yes, one could quote Yogi Berra, the, 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 the American player and later kind of philosopher, that it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. But still, we can, we can try. Bad news. Russia will never let Belarus go, period. It's crucially important for, for Russia to keep Belarus in its sphere of interest and under strong influence. Not necessarily control, but influence. Also, from, both from the military security perspective, imagine Belarus becoming a NATO member country, theoretically. It would mean that the NATO-Russia border is 300 kilometers away from Moscow. This will Moscow never let happen. And the, the other reason why Moscow will never let Belarus go, as long as Russia is as we know it, is simply regime security perspectives. The crisis in Ukraine was already inconvenient for, uh, for the Kremlin, because for the average Russian voter, if they see that Ukraine can make a change, Ukraine can transform herself, the question may, the average Russian voter may ask, if Ukrainian brothers can do it, why can't we? Imagine the same thing happening in Belarus. And last year, this was equally inconvenient for, for the Kremlin from regime security perspective, what happened in Belarus. So starting from the position that Russia will never let Belarus go, I think the most likely scenario is 
that we are soon going to see a constitutional reform and the succession process starting. Constitutional reform would imply that there, are, there is a need for new presidential elections and Alexander Grigorievich is unlikely to participate in that elections. That's a convenient way of exit for him. And the succession, unfortunately, will be dominated by Russia. Yes, we, have, we need to show solidarity with the Belarusian opposition. We need to support all those brave people who are still in the country and also the ones who took up the extremely hard burden of actually leaving their homeland. We need to support them, but processes, political transformation inside Belarus is likely to be dominated by, uh, by Russia. Who the successor will be, we don't know yet. And what's the worst case scenario? You asked about the airbase. The airbase itself doesn't matter much due to three reasons. First, Belarus is an, integra is an integral part of Russian military planning. It has always been. Zapad exercises demonstrated this quite, quite accurately. Second, the forces originally intended to be deployed to the Bobruisk airbase are already in Kaliningrad for two years. Uh, third, since September the 3rd this year, Russia has established the, the military presence of its fighting forces in Belarus in two frameworks. First, there is a joint air defense training center in Grodno, close to the Polish border. Sure, it's, off, it's only a training center, absolutely. Uh, and the second thing, Russia is establishing rotational presence of its fighter jets, Suhoi 35s, in, uh, in Bobruisk. It's going to be a rotational presence, but as rotational as the NATO presence in the Baltic states. So basically, Russia's military presence in, uh, in Belarus with, with fighting or fighting capable forces is already a fact. The worst case scenario, I think, actually, interestingly enough, both for the Belarusians and also for NATO, is if Russia goes for annexation of Belarus. So to, to, to destroy Belarus's sovereignty. Good news, it's unlikely to happen. Why? Because Russia doesn't need it. Just imagine what happens if Russia annexes Belarus. What would Russia get? Russia would get more than a thousand kilometers of new NATO border. It's inconvenient. It's much better to have a buffer state in between, right? Second, more than nine million people to feed when the Russian budget is already overstretched. Third, what if the Belarusians resist? I, do we have so, time for one final yeah. question? Sure. One final question is okay? okay. So they won't okay. go for annexation. Yes. So uh, we have one final question. Anya has been waiting patiently. She can have our yep. final question. And uh, unfortunately, it'll have to be a brief answer. I know it is almost impossible to answer these complexions very briefly. It, it, I think it will require a brief answer. So, um, so I'm a lecturer at, the, at Sciences Po and the American School of Grenoble. And I'm asking regarding on the topic of critical awareness regarding post-secondary and secondary education, because it's a major buzzword going on about critical thinking uh, to counter misinformation and disinformation. But there, is there any collaboration in NATO's agenda to bring this down into the education level? Anyone can take on this question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a bit loaded, sorry. <laughs> I hope there is. I don't know. Because right now in the... Uh, I'm in not aware also. Okay. Because it's a major buzzword in, in the education mm -hmm. fear about critical thinking. But I don't see any collaboration going on about actually informing students on where they read their social media from. And they're highly influenced, and that's where they're forming opinions. But there, it's not being taught in schools on how to actually regard it and see if it's misinformation that they're reading, unless an individual teacher takes that on in the classroom. I'm also not sure, actually, whether the, you know, the, the way, the key to the current youth start is necessarily through school. I was looking at my own kids and they seem to be learning a whole of a lot from, you know, actual online uh, sources. So I think in a way, uh, something educationally equivalent, and again, I bring in the uh, sort of uh, example of the EU here, what EU does in terms of its myth busting, in terms of uh, countering disinformation, something like this probably can be done also more uh, as an educational outreach. Uh, again, I'm not necessarily convinced that's, that's what NATO is currently invested in, nor am I convinced that this is necessarily something that it should pay too much attention to. 
Okay, well, uh, we are running over time, so I would like to give a very warm thank you to all of our speakers, Sur Suraita Maria, thank you Alexandra, thank you Andras. Uh, we have uh, gifts for in-person participants, and Maria, I regret to say for <laughs> online, that makes it very, very difficult, but I hope that we'll meet in Tartu or Tallinn at some point in time in the near future, and thank you everyone for your questions, very sharp questions. Uh, so we have something for Andras and Alexandra, and thank you.